Now, you cannot get the tax benefits of a Tekikaku Nankin or a tax qualified pension unless you have 20 employees. Okay, and then you can do it with a life insurance company. Once you fund that though, you can't get your hands on the money. That, that goes to the employee. You can do it with a trust bank if you have over 100 employees. Okay, so many of you are not funding obviously and it's just as well that you're not funding. You're just carrying a book reserve. And I'll, I'll tell you why. One, one little strategic tool that, that we have is if your lump sum retirement benefit is too rich, uh, in other words, if it wasn't set up right, if you're dividing annual income by 12, you have no non-pensionable allowances, you have no second salary concept or Dainikuyo type concept of non-pensionable um, salary, then uh, we can come in and we can uh, say that, okay, we're going to change this, we're going to make it right, we're going to maybe cut back the factors in the table, we're going re to we're going to redesign compensation, but to basically neutralize that adverse impact we're going to fund now for the first time. And you can tell them up until now it's a paper benefit. You know, I mean, it, it could, we didn't have to pay it. We could be irresponsible and not pay it. But once we fund, it's yours. So I think that if, you're, if your lump sum retirement benefit program, uh, your pension program hasn't been set up right, you can, you can take a look at that thing and then you can say, if you have over 20 employees, well, we will fund. And uh, uh, sorry guys, you know, we've just got to get it in line with local practice. The big break on you is really not only the law, potential litigation, but it's also the, will they quit? Will they quit on me? Will they leave? You know, um, I mean, you, c you can make some changes, but if employees go out and look for a, the old contract terms, you know, that's not helpful either. But certainly, no, there's nothing that says you have to pay them. There are lawyers who say that there can't be negative change or adverse change, but uh, I've never agreed with that. I mean, I think that what you've got to watch out for the most is, I mean, the last thing you should do is terminate people. In lieu of termination or cutting back staff, you should be free to do just about anything within an organization. And it's always a good opportunity um, to, uh, rather than cut back staff, to instead go back into the organization and almost set up with the employees the notion that in lieu of, in lieu of transfer, or sorry, in lieu of termination, we're going to make these other changes. If we don't make these other changes, 20 or 30 people have to leave, but if we can make them, maybe only uh, 5 or 10 people will leave. So, you know, it's, I mean, it's a difficult question. I, I think in, in reality, though, like just this week, we, we had a case where a company was dividing annual income by 12, and um, the client now appreciates the problems with that. He'd like to do something about it. So I suggested that they divide annual income by 17, and come out with that figure and add that on to the, the total annual income as a sweetener and then, and then divide out by 17 again and also uh, come up with a non-pensionable salary component concept. Rules of employment, you have to have them legally if you have over 10 employees, okay? And you have to appreciate what rules of employment are all about. In Japan, the role of the individual contract is very limited and they don't have employee handbooks and company policy manuals to quite the extent that we have in the United States. Instead, you have something which is really a, a legal binding contract. Article 89 of the Labor Standards Law says that you must have rules of employment. And they have to define essentially everything that, that, that you do for your employees. Now, there aren't that many things the law requires you to do, but it is true once they're in rules of employment, you're supposed to abide by what you've set up unless you can change your rules of employment. Well, how do you change your rules of employment? The employer still is, is, is basically free to change those rules. If you have a labor union, you have to negotiate with the union. Collective bargaining agreements take precedence over uh, rules of employment. So you would first have to negotiate a certain issue. But I guess the, the notion would be that if you reach impasse, then you're, uh, you, you have no choice but to make a certain change as a rule of employment change. And, uh, you know, we've had to do uh, quite a lot of that for, for certain companies, uh, in a number of companies. Uh, it's a good idea to certainly exclude temporary and contract employees from the coverage of your, of your rules. Maybe to have separate regulations covering temporary uh, employees. And some of the things that you should 
look for in your rules of employment, you want to make sure that you have a good transfer clause. That's important by both place of work and also job function. You should have a good probation clause. There's no law which says how long probation should be. Generally, it tends to be around uh, uh, three months, say renewable for another three months. I would suggest that with many employees, you really need six months to know whether they're going to make it. Uh, you're, uh, if you move on down through the way typical rules of employment are set up, you start to get into such notions as the working day. And the working day, as I said, it can be a full eight hours. They're starting to talk about cutting that back. And they have a plan, uh, uh, you probably read in the newspaper, for gradually cutting back working hours. Uh, but the way the law is set up now, it's uh, basically eight working hours. That's Jitsu Rodo Jikan, actual working hours, eight hours. With lunch, that would then be uh, nine hours. And s full day on Saturday is also possible in Japan. Okay, Full day work is possible, eight hours. I don't, I'm not suggesting this at all. Even our company doesn't work on Saturday. <laughs> uh, and that's saying something. Cause, uh, but uh, you know, in terms of holidays, public holidays in Japan, they are not, you don't have to give public holidays, right? That's not a labor standards law holiday. Sunday doesn't have to be given, right? All, you ha all the labor standards law says is that you have to give four days, four days a month, right? One day a week, one day a week. That's all that you have to do. So, you know, if you're a factory, uh, you have uh, complete flexibility. I mean, in reality, you don't, obviously, right? If you want to have good employees and keep them, but legally, you can, uh, you know, set up schedules uh, if you have a holiday change clause such that people can work on Sundays and have Monday off or whatever. In terms of uh, annual paid holidays, the labor standards law holds that the first year you don't have to give uh, any any annual paid holidays. Now, you know, that, that obviously isn't going to fly. That's not going to work at all. And then the second year, if somebody had 80% attendance the first year, you have to give uh, six, uh, six days. And then one additional day for each year of service, OK? But you can do any, any number of combinations within there as long as you, you make the legal uh, minimums. Now, in reality, I think most companies are starting out with about maybe eight, 10 days the first year, prorating it. And some companies maybe even with 12. So that would be maybe one, you could take one day for, for each month of uh, service. Uh, and th there is a maximum of 20 days. Some banks, though, that traditionally work people on Saturdays uh, did uh, provide more than 20 days of paid leave, which would be basically four weeks. Uh, other things in, in your rules of employment, it also affects the compensation area especially since April 1st, 19, uh, 1986. I think it's not a good idea to pay uh, maternity leave and also menstrual leave, OK? I mean, there are only three countries in the world I've heard. I don't know. I haven't, you know, what, what, I've, what I've heard is that maybe only Japan, Korea, and I think Spain or Mexico have uh, menstrual leave which the law says that you have to give the number of days necessary for that. But uh, if you pay it, what you're asking for, some, some women will take, you know, extra days. I mean, you're giving some certain employees an extra 12 days of, of paid holiday, uh, which maybe is okay. I don't know. I, I saw some faces there, and maybe we got some questions on that. Uh, but uh, I don't know what it feels like myself, actually. But. Uh, <coughs> But, you know, when it's not paid, the girls come in anyway, okay? When, when it's not paid and when they have to use up their own paid annual leave, okay, for it, uh, mostly they will come in. When, when it is paid, there's a tendency not to take it. Let's just say that no Japanese companies pay it, okay? And I'm getting, I shouldn't have come today, really. From the beginning, <laughs> it was a hard start, you know? I think it was a hard start because I was trying to talk about that soft stuff, which I haven't been too interested in for a long time. but. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, let's go on with this maternity leave too now. Uh, that again, the law, the law requires that uh, 
it used to re the law changed. It used to require that you have to give six weeks before and six weeks after childbirth. Okay. And uh, uh, it, no Japanese company pays it flat out. Very few foreign companies do either. They don't, they don't pay the full thing. You can get your 60% from health insurance, 60% of the standard rem remuneration table if you apply for the, for, the, for the social insurances, for health insurance from the government. Now, uh, that was changed to 10 weeks of maternity leave for multiple births, which I guess means twins or triplets, right? Uh, you have to give 10 weeks, and um, you have to give eight, you have to make eight weeks available after childbirth now instead of six, as of April 1st, 1986. And the employer has an obligation to make the woman not come to work for six weeks after childbirth. It used to be five, okay? Now, in reality, if a woman wants to come in, she gave, she had her, she gave childbirth and her, her mother is taking care of the baby and everything else. If she wants to come in and work, especially, um, she would want to do that if you were set up such that she isn't paid when she doesn't come in. Then, obviously, she's not going to complain, I guess, and you're not going to have a problem. But the law does say that you, ha you can't let her come to work for, for six weeks. It used to be five. Okay? Um, you know what Japanese companies had always done. I mean, they used to try and get rid of the, the girls uh, when they weren't quite as pretty, when they were no longer the office flower. And they certainly put tremendous pressure on them to leave uh, when they got, even when they got married. I know when I got married, um, I spent a couple uh, hours a week in a, in a bank. And I married a girl from that bank. And uh, right away, they told her that, you know, they said, well, I guess you'll, you'll be leaving now after the marriage and think about having children. And you know, yes, OK. And all right, so she left. And <laughs> it was tough, you know. Uh, OK, now, some other things in rules of employment. Um, you. Uh, I mentioned before, I think one important thing is to set up the concept of, of genkyu or, or pay cut, for example, for disciplinary reasons or, you know, for lack of, when, you, when someone doesn't have full attendance. I mean, you should set that up that, that pay will be cut back on monthly salary. That, that would be important to do. And uh, you should have good duties and obligations clauses, which I think sort of set up your corporate culture or your uh, kind of your standards of, of behavior and performance for your employees. And it should go beyond uh, just such things as, um, you know, not defaming the company's reputation or, uh, you know, not, not, not committing violence uh, within the firm or, or lying on resumes. And this gets into the disciplinary reasons, too. And I think that it's, it's strategically sound to have the two linked, to have the duties and obligations clauses linked up with good, detailed disciplinary regulations. Uh, one reason why disciplinary regulations have to be detailed is that basically the courts here do not feel that the employer just has an intrinsic right to discipline, okay, because he is the employer. It has to come from the contract. And in Japan, since the rules of employment are the contract, um, you've got to stipulate in detail the grounds for any actions that you're going to take against employees. So it can look kind of, uh, kind of silly, I mean, you know, putting it all in there. But if it's not there, in fact, first of all, your corporate counsel will look at them and they'll say, well, no, actually, it's going to be a little difficult to get rid of this man or, you know, to cut back his pay or whatever because the grounds aren't here. Uh, well, the ground should have been there to begin with and should be there in detail. Um, now, one thing that I think is, is important, and this goes beyond, a little bit beyond what, what traditional, typical local practice is, is to set up an ability in, in your work rules not only to, uh, you know, give verbal warning or written notice to an employee, provide suspension of attendance with or without pay, uh, and to cut back pay for a, a given disciplinary infraction, which by the labor standards law is limited to one-tenth of the pay during that pay period. 
labor standards law specifically says that you can only cut back pay by one-tenth of the amount of that pay period. But you have to go beyond that. And one of your keys to getting poor performers out of your firm is to have uh, a demotion change of job function. Uh, or basically, yeah, change of, change of uh, demotion, change of job function concept, such that you can permanently demote or adjust the pay level of the employee. And that should be written in there. And that's extremely important. Because we'll get to this later on, talking about getting rid of the poor performer. But uh, termination, just basically, uh, you, you, you can't do it here if there is litigation. I mean, it's an, it's an absolute nuisance. It's the path of the most resistance. It can lead to a temporary restraining order and an injunction of the person back into the job. And then the burden of, that's, that's, that's a temporary restraining order, so then the burden of, of proof is on you and you have to go to district court and sue to get the injunction taken away, okay? And that takes generally two and a half years, right? District court's two and a half years, the witnesses and so on uh, appear. The superior court is just done, I guess, uh, without witnesses based on looking at documents, so that's a bit quicker, but you don't want that, okay? So what I think the, a real key to success and one of your most important tools is rather than kicking people out in the street, really try and rehabilitate them in a responsible way and let them know that you came in here, we, we offered you too much, we paid you too much, we don't, you don't have to leave, but we've got to do something about it. And we'd like you to take this job at a lower salary. You want the man to believe that you're happy to have him work in that job at that salary, even if you're not, okay, that's not important. Clients come to me and they say, we've got to get this guy out. Got to be out. One client called up and said, I've already offered him an extra 13 million yen above normal involuntary retirement. Uh, and he wants more. He's holding out. So I said, uh, I said, well, Bill, you know, his name was Bill. Right? I said, uh, Bill, um, take it, you're taking the wrong track. You know, we're, we're moving into Christmas and New Year's vacation. So um, come back. Just tell the man, look, there's, there's some reorganization and, you know, this function is going to move it was an investment, investment banking. Capital markets is going to come in. So tell them that, that we can change the job. We still want you. We can still use you. Come back in January and say that to them. But say that since you haven't performed in this job, we'd like to do it with a 30% pay cut. And uh, it ended up that uh, the man uh, left anyway without, without that 13 million yen, and he gave it up. The reason is, if he thinks that the only thing that you want to do, the only thing that you can do is you've got to get him out of that organization, he's in a very strong bargaining position, okay? Now, normally with most employees, they leave, right? Everything's fine, you know, you, you understand each other, you know you haven't performed, you don't have a problem, but if push gets to shove, you've got to know what you're up against, right? So um, he's in a strong bargaining position and it's pretty hard to just get somebody out. But the big secret, the big key to success in doing it is to offer another job. And not necessarily just a job that you won't like that much. I think you also have to be able to adjust pay. But you better have that in your rules of employment. And that has been the key to getting rid of some 70 poor performers for us with clients. With only two cases of litigation. And in both cases, the client went ahead and terminated, okay? Understandable why um, lawyers and people aren't as familiar with these other concepts. And sometimes you, you have to get rid of the employee. And, uh, uh, but uh, I suppose you could even have an employee stay at home, change the job and have him stay at home and pay him the lower salary, right? That would be one thing. Or it, there are a lot of little tricks that can be tried. I don't necessarily recommend them, but you can also lay employees off with 60% pay. You can, you can put them on layoff, so there's some saving there. Unions can create problems for you. Um, I mean, even if it's 20%, I think you have to worry about it. If there are just two people, they can start a labor union. And you have to negotiate with them in, in some form, basically, okay? But one of the first things you negotiate is when do we meet? 
how often do we meet, who meets, right? So you, with a minority union, you decide maybe once a month, maybe you meet with them. Even if they go to a labor relations commission and they compare, they complain that you're not bargaining in good faith, they can only go to a labor relations commission if they're a qualified trade union, which means they have a constitution and uh, they basically registered at the, uh, at the Labor Relations Commission. But, uh, so you'll get that kind of a complaint. You'll, you'd have to send somebody to a hearing once in a while. I mean, it is troublesome. I think it's, uh, 